Welcome everybody um, to today's uh, CMR Journal Club, uh, co-hosted uh, also or endorsed by the SCMR. Um, before we get started, uh, as usual, there are housekeeping issues uh, or uh, topics. Please mute yourself uh, if you're not speaking. And uh, um, once you have a question also, just uh, unmute yourself and speak up or you can also type your question into the chat, uh, then uh, we'll uh, answer them or have them answered. So I also have a particular welcome to Massimo Imazio, uh, who is the first author of uh, the first paper we will discuss, and also then uh, uh, Gonkiat from uh, Chicago for the, for the second uh, paper. And uh, I think we also will have um, uh, Michael Markle, I see he has already joined. Hi, Michael. Uh, also, Hi, how are you? He's the senior author of the second paper. So as usual, this is a very informal, quick uh, journal club. So we uh, will briefly discuss papers within 10 minutes and then have five minutes uh, discussion and uh, just to answer the question, what can we learn from that? And uh, this journal club, after it has been basically kidnapped by COVID for uh, a couple of months now is the first one where we slowly phase out where it's not just about COVID, uh, but it is still about a topic related very much to COVID, and that's myocardial inflammation. Um, and uh, the first paper we usually do not review uh, or discuss reviews here, but this one I found particularly well written, and uh, so that's why I wanted to discuss that and. Uh, Massimo is with us and he allowed me to basically to walk through the paper and then we can uh, answer, we can have him answer any questions to that. So <clears throat> this review paper addresses the very important uh, question. Um, what does it mean if people having COVID have a troponin? Troponin is a very sensitive marker for any myocardial uh, injury. Uh, it's leaking from cardiomyocytes. So something is wrong then in the heart. But we also know that troponin is a very sensitive marker in terms of also reporting if there's just some overload of the, of the left ventricle or in atrial fibrillation and especially aggravated by kidney uh, dysfunction when the troponin is not uh, metabolized or excreted properly. So uh, that why, that's why it was a very important question to, to answer. And uh, we have a lot of evidence uh, pointing into several directions. Um, and this review here actually summarizes that very well. So what they, what the authors did here uh, was to discuss first, and I just walked through that. Uh, first, what, what, what are the mechanisms behind, uh, what, what makes this infection so special for the heart? And uh, we discussed this in several previous uh, journal clubs. So there, there are a few, um, there are a few uh, conditions and, and uh, relationships, uh, metabolic relationships that makes uh, the uh, virus, so SARS-CoV virus 2, so special. And uh, it's probably around a specific receptor that gives us the answer, and that's the ACE2 receptor. And <clears throat> that's what the author, author's first uh, target here. Um, so ACE2 um, uh, basically uh, produces or helps producing uh, angiotensin 1,7 from angiotensin 2. And this is very important because this reduces inflammation and uh, leads to vasodilation, so a re reduction of blood pressure. So it's basically a good guy. Um, and once possible, it helps uh, get over an inflammation. And, uh, and uh, lucky or, or um, luckily, uh, this is usually the case in most of the inflammations that go on, but unfortunately in, uh, in the, in the uh, case of COVID-19, what we have is because uh, the virus, um, the SARS virus actually enters the cells through the ACE2 receptors. So the ACE2 receptors basically get uh, lost, um, and this is what 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 happens, uh, and probably lays the the paves the way for this uncontrolled, and occasionally very very severe inflammation, that uh, then can be deadly 
including uh, patients uh, of young age who otherwise do not have any additional um, risk factors. So ACE2 is involved in inflammation and also in vascular permeability. And we had also discussed that before. So it promotes endothelial dysfunction, vascular inflammation, and because it's endothelitis, it's also uh, thrombogenic. So it also can form thrombi. And that's all not the case in, uh, in regular influenza as uh, some additional uh, papers have shown. And this gives me the opportunity to briefly mention uh, other important papers in that context. So this is by, by Varga et al, published in the, the Lancet uh, in April, uh, showing that, uh, that the, there is endothelitis, so inflammation in the endothelium, um, and that um, this is uh, co-located with uh, the, the virus, whereas inflammation in the cardiomyocytes is not. Then another uh, paper here by Chen and co-workers on the ACE2 expression in the human hearts, uh, and it, it confirms that uh, ACE2 is very, uh, not only very abundant in the heart, but also is associated with heart failure. That's what they could show here. So um, then there was another uh, paper by Ackermann and, and co-workers um, that showed the similar relationship in the lungs. So we deal here with a virus that hits the organism at a very sensitive point, and that's the ACE2, inhibit, uh, ACE2 uh, receptor. So that should not be confused with ACE1 and also the ACE inhibitors, and that's nicely um, nicely explained in this review paper, which, by the way, you can download from, from the Journal Club website as a, as a PDF. So here, figure one shows this relationship in a, in a graphic form. So uh, ang 17 uh, leads to vasorelaxation, anti, is anti-inflammatory, anti antioxidative, and also antifibrotic. And uh, if that is missing because the ACE2 cannot do its job, then it may happen what we see in clinical routine that we have some patients get into myocardial edema and then stay there for longer than they should be. And then in the review here, they uh, also discuss about the other organs, kidney, brain, and the general inflammation and some other aspects of inflammation. But then focusing on the heart, looking at, okay, what is what, is, what actually happens then uh, on, a, on a tissue level? And uh, we have myocardial injury and the, uh, the troponin is increased, especially in severe cases, not in all cases with COVID-19, but in the more severe cases, it's very frequently increased. And looking at the published data, it looks like, and that's why I fully agree with Massimo and the, and the, and the uh, list of co-authors, that most of these are likely due to non-ischemic uh, injury that is not a direct viral toxicity, but secondary to all these factors associated with severe systemic inflammation, like hypoxia, a septic approach with relative myocardial uh, insufficiency and coronary insufficiency, thrombotic uh, events. So all these, uh, these factors that could hit a heart in any very severe systematic uh, systemic inflammation. So that is, that is a very important aspect. Ischemic injuries, however, are uh, on the other hand, are less frequent. And it's also our experience. And also, if you look at the case reports, there's just one convincing case report with a clearly ischemic injury. And the others are more pointing towards non-ischemic. And then there is, of course, my pet disease, uh, myocarditis. Uh, and of course, myocarditis happens. And uh, there, there are, have been a couple of uh, case reports uh, also recently. Um, but interestingly, they all come without the typical uh, viral injury in terms of the late enhancement, the subepicardial late enhancement. So this also to me points to the fact that probably in we, what we deal here with is that the myocardium gets inflamed, but not because it's attacked directly, but because the, the systemic effects of all these cytokines and uh, the ACE2 uh, receptor that allows for uh, capillary leakage and allows for edema, that, uh, that this is, is basically what's happening in the myocardium. And that also explains why dexamethasone, which, has, uh, which reduces edema, may have its place in therapy. It's so far the, probably the most successful therapeutic approach uh, we, we have uh, evidence for. And, but coming back to the review paper, they also discussed then also how the renal uh, aspect is linked with the heart. But looking at the heart here, it's summarized 
we actually have to uh, have to look at uh, the effects of uh, general hypoxia in patients with advanced respiratory failure, sepsis, then the systemic inflammation itself, and then thromboembolic uh, problems, and then which is sort of linked to systemic inflammation. If you have severe inflammation, for example, by a catecholamine shower, then your heart response, uh, and we know that from Takotsubo, responds with edema, and it can also go to dysfunction. And then there's also probably a very small place for classic myocarditis, although there has been even one report uh, with electron microscopy showing that while there is there was in that case, there was virus material in the myocardium, in the myocardial cells, it was not associated in these cells with uh, leukocytes. So uh, the direct viral toxic uh, uh, effect of inducing inflammation may be less important. So then, um, uh, then the, the authors discuss this here uh, very nicely and also the aspects around the thrombotic effects, which, is, which are yes, uh, yet not that well understood. And also looking at uh, the impact on the endothelial cell uh, function and um, the aspects of the, the, um, the inflammation there. And then, uh, of course, percal effusion is also some of that. And then what they conclude is basically summarize that together so that the findings do not provide sufficient and convincing evidence of a direct infection and replication of the virus in the, in the cells, but more likely a non-ischemic myocardial injury related to different possible mechanisms, such as hypoxia, sepsis, inf inflammation, thromboembolism, cytokine storm, and eventually could summarize that all as a kind of a stress-induced uh, cardiomyopathy. And we have seen this also in, in Montreal that the patients had edema, but basically nothing much else. And then probably less, less likely an ischemic myocardial injury uh, due to the endothelial uh, implication. So all in all, this, this paper is certainly um, uh, important. And yes, it's also important that the, the value of cardiac MR is appreciated here because cardiac MR is the only imaging technique that can visualize all that. So this, this paper certainly, I think, should uh, everybody who's interested in COVID-19 and the heart uh, should have a look at that. It's, it's a very nice uh, summary of the current evidence. And so I want to congratulate you, Massimo, for that work. And the question to you is, um, is there anything that, from your point of view, was the most important take-home message from your work and from your review of the literature? So what do you think, and also with your personal experience, uh, in, in, in Turin, Torino, um, what, what, is, what is what you consider the most important aspects uh, of a cardiac COVID-19 infection or coronavirus infection? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, well, I'm working in Torino. Torino is in the northwest of Italy, close to Mil Milan region. So we were deeply impacted by COVID-19. And um, so troponin elevation was very common in, in patients uh, at the beginning uh, of the pandemic in Italy. Um, it was reported maybe up in 15 percent of cases. Uh, and uh, the, the first uh, doubt, the first uh, concern of, of us cardiologists was, but is this uh, myocarditis? Uh, and the, what we understood from, uh, from the clinical cases is that in, in the majority of cases, this is not myocarditis, uh, but uh, as uh, you also well pointed out, uh, it is uh, something related to the systemic inflammation or some secondary causes. Uh, we also had the chance to, to do some cardiac magnetic resonance imaging in these patients, and we also had evidence of uh, uh, myocardial edema uh, in, in this patient and uh, also many of these patients had some forms of pericardial disease with pericardial effusion and, and chest pain that can be attributed to myopericardial disease. So um, I think that uh, we should uh, be very critical considering the troponin elevation and so far we don't have uh, a clear-cut evidence that the COVID-19 can uh, cause direct infection uh, of the myocardium so far. And, um, and cardiac magnetic resonance is a very powerful and useful tool to be considered, uh, although it's sometimes very difficult to be used because of the uh, problem of, of the infection, of uh, the sanification of, uh, of, uh, of CMR uh, laboratory and so on. But uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I think 
that now things are changing in Italy because now the disease is almost disappeared. So it is not so common to, to have severe cases, but we will see in, uh, at the end of the summer what, what things are going if we will have a second uh, pandemic surge or, or so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so before we have to move on, uh, just one quick question. Um, uh, do you have any follow-up studies? Because what we have seen in a small number of, uh, we, we do not have that much experience, but we have seen that in, in patients, apparently the edema may persist. And some of the reports of ongoing symptoms, even long after the actual disease, makes me worry is this edema more severe, more, uh, more prolonged? And thereby also, we know that edema over a long period can induce diffuse fibrosis. So you, do you have any experience with follow-up of these uh, patients with cardiac COVID? Yes, thank you. This is a very interesting question. Yes, under a clinical point of view, this patient had very prolonged course with the prolonged symptoms, especially younger patients. And um, mm. we are now uh, calling all the patients to have a um, CMR at six months, just to have a follow-up CMR. Uh, mm -hmm. But we are still collecting data because uh, uh, as you know, the pandemic deeply affected our area uh, the end of February, March. So we, we, are, we are just now calling the, our patient just to have, uh, uh, to have this, uh, this evidence and uh, to collect more data, to have a follow-up uh, yeah. CMR. Yeah. Okay, yeah, because this is my worry that uh, this disease is like Takotsubo, but just not going away that quickly and, uh, and stays there for longer and then induces, especially in younger people where this is a very uh, prominent, uh, long-standing dysfunction. Thank you so much, Massimo. So we will have to move on. So uh, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Michael Marker as a senior author and Konkiat, I know if I can pronounce it properly, Chai Krang Krai uh, from Chicago to present their paper, Prognostic Value of Microbial Exosolia Volume Fraction and T2 Mapping in Heart Transplant Patients. So it's also about edema and uh, inflammation. So take it from here, Konkia. Good morning. Um, thank you for the invitation. Good morning from the Midwest. My name is Konkia Chai Krenkrai. You would pronounce it perfectly. Um, I had a great opportunity to work with Michael Marco, our senior author, who's joining us today also. And also my co-first author, Muhannad Abu Abbasi, and all the other co-authors listed here in our um, article. Um, we wanted to um, do this study um, last year because T1 mapping and T2 mapping in heart transplant population um, is a relatively a new uh, modalities. And before we published the study, there was no uh, prognostic studies that look into T1 mapping and T2 mapping in this particular pop population. Mainly uh, studies were about um, diagnostic accuracy of T1 or T2 mapping to diagnose cardiac allograft vasculopathy or allograft rejection. So I, I think before um, these modalities can be a mainstream in clinical use, uh, there have to be some prognostic studies that show some value um, to it. So that's why we decided to do the studies. Um, this study is a single center observational prospective cohort study. Um, <clears throat> we were supported by an, a grant from a National Institute of Health. We had uh, adult heart transplant patients aged 18 to 89 years old. And the exclusion criteria is the usual um, contraindications for cardiac MRI scan. Um, we had 114 patients enrolled in the studies. We excluded 15 patients and <clears throat> we divided um, the final cohort into two cohorts, looking at two things. The first cohort had 90 patients um, and we used this cohort to evaluate prognostic study for T1 mapping, including extracellular volume fraction or ECV. And cohort number two has 79 patients that we um, were looking at a T2 mapping prognostic value. All the scan that we did um, was performed with a 1.5 Tesla scanner. And in addition to the, the usual um, sequences that we use, for example, a CNA imaging by um, steady state free precision um, sequence and a late gadolinium enhancement, <coughs> um, we we also did a T1 mapping with a modified look locker inversion recovery technique or MOLLE and T2 by um, T2 prep SSFP images. 
in terms of clinical events that we look at, uh, we look at all clinical events and cardiac events. For all clinical events, it includes death, non-fatal myocardial infarction, coronary revascularization, and all unplanned hospitalization. For just the cardiac events, uh, we only look at um, cardiac death, non-fatal myocardial infarction, coronary revascularization, and heart failure hospitalization. In terms of statistics, um, in addition to the, the usual um, descriptive statistical uh, methods, uh, we use univaluable and multivaluable Cox regression analysis to evaluate um, outcomes in our study. And this is a table one uh, patient characteristics in our study. You see that you see that un, uh, in the red box here is the cohort number one that we look at um, T1 mapping values. And under the green box here is uh, for the T2 mapping values. Uh, for cohort one that uh, we evaluate T1 mapping values, uh, uh, we divided patients into three groups based on their extracellular volume fraction or ECV. If their ECV is in the first tercile, which is 25% uh, in our study, uh, they grow into the first group. If they're in the second tercile, which is 25% to 29%, they're in the second group. And if their ECV is more than 29%, they're in the third group. Um, so we are looking at about an average of approximately 50 years old uh, patients, about 60% male, and except for uh, dyslipidemia, um, there is no other significant difference be, uh, among the three groups in terms of patient demographic and use of uh, medications. Also, there is no significant difference in presence of late gadolinium enhancement or at the extent of the enhancement. However, there are some, uh, there are significant difference um, in invasive hemodynamic data, we found that patients with higher ECV had higher right atrial pressures, uh, right ventricular pressures, and uh, pulmonary pressures, including wedge pressures. For the second cohort that we looked at T2 mapping, uh, we divided patients into two groups based on their um, T2. If their T2 is less than the median T2, which is 50.2 millisecond in our study, they belong in the, into the first group. Um, otherwise, they're in the second group. And the only significant difference in terms of demographic and medication use is um, the beta blocker medication use. Otherwise, there's no significant difference um, static, statistically, both in demographics, medication use, as well as cardiac MI parameters and invasive hemodynamic data. Um, in the cohort number one that uh, we look at T T1 values, um, about 49% of the patients had at least one follow-up cardiac MR. So we were also looking at um, the follow-up MR uh, T1 mapping values and see if there's any difference from the baseline in terms of natural history of it. We only found that um, only post-contrast T1 had um, a, a, a lower post T1 value compared to the baseline, but otherwise the native T1 value and ECV have no significant has no significant difference in terms of um, progression or regression of the values, and this is over a span of approximately one year. And we try to cat categorize all these numbers into groups and see if there's any obvious trend that we could see. And I I don't observe any obvious trend in the T1 mapping values. In terms of prognosis of T1 values, um, <clears throat> the follow-up studies is an average 2.4 years. This is the median values. And we had 36% of the patients um, who developed clinical outcomes. And that include three deaths, six heart failure hospitalization, three coronary revascularization by percutaneous intervention, and 20 non-cardiac hospitalization, which is comprised of mainly in infection-related hospitalization. Um, we found that univaluable predictor for clinical outcomes um, are higher ECV, presence of late gadolinium enhancement, larger left ventricular and systolic volume index, 
and higher right atrial pressures, right ventricular pressures, and pulmonary pressures, including wedge pressure. When we um, evaluate in multivariable analysis in terms of ECV, first we adjust it with um, some cardiac MRI parameters, and we found that higher ECV, more than 29% compared to less than 25%, remain um, associated with our, our clinical outcomes uh, after adjustment for left, left ventricular size and presence of late gadolinium enhancement. However, after we adjust um, ECV with in, invasive hemodynamic data, um, the association of ECV and outcomes remain uh, become ex insignificant. Uh, and and this is to point out also that this is an association with all clinical outcomes. We didn't find any significant different uh, significant association of ECV with cardiac outcomes per se. On the other hand, for T2 um, values, um, the follow-up duration is 3.5 years, and 48% of the patient eventually had um, clinical outcomes, and that include 18 cardiac events listed here and 20 non-cardiac hospitalization. Um, and T2, higher T2, more than 50.2 milliseconds in our study was associated with both all clinical outcomes and cardiac outcomes. When e we evaluate that in a multivariable analysis, um, this is the result. So the red box here is for cardiac events and the blue box is for all clinical events. You see that um, T2, higher, higher T2 level remains significantly associated with both cardiac events and non-cardiac events after adjustment with cardiac MI parameters or invasive hemodynamic um, data. Uh, and that's true for both um, cardiac events and clinical events. And this is a Kaplan -Meier curve, adjusted Kaplan-Meier curve of ECV and T2. Um, so the section A here is ECV uh, for all clinical events, which uh, is independently associated. And for ECV and cardiac events, we did not find significant association after the adjustment. For T2 for all events uh, and T2 for cardiac events, um, it is associated with um, clinical outcomes uh, even after um, all adjustments. The limitation in our study that I saw was the fact that it, it is a single center study uh, and we have limited follow-up interval in terms of T1 mapping, follow-up scan, and also follow-up duration for clinical events. And there, there are some relevant clinical information that were not available to us to include in our multi-valuable analysis. And those include all the prior significant infections, um, or any cardiac markers, for example, troponin, or other cardiac MI parameters, for example, myocardial strain information and myocardial perfusion reserve. So in, in con conclusion, um, what we found was that um, there are some prognostic values of T1 and T2 mapping. In terms of T1 mapping, it's mainly ECV and T2 value for the T1, T2 mapping in this population. Um, this in so the so what we are seeing from now is that uh, likely uh, before it becomes a clinical decision making tools, it needs more studies to understand uh, more of the prognostic value of both and to confirm our data uh, our findings as well. Thank you very much. Uh, so. Um, what I find interesting, and uh, we only have a minute basically left. Um, so, does it could that mean? And that's my question to you. Uh, and thanks for the for the for the great walk through your paper. Um, could it be that uh, what we observe here, what you observed here, that the pers persisting because these were not the patients in an acute clinical uh, status, so that kind of persisting high T two as a marker for ongoing myocardial edema, and that relates to what we discussed before with COVID, that this may be a bigger problem than many previously thought, and a problem that may not necessarily be evident when you just look at T1. Um, so 
uh, T2 has already uh, uh, shown lots of potential in heart transplant patients, but most have related that to an acute rejection. And uh, certainly that's the case, but could this be evidence that there's also a kind of a chronic form of smoldering microbial inflammation that over time damages the heart by making it stiff and fibrotic? What do you I think, think that's, that's one of the possibilities. So in, when we selected the, the, the T2 mapping cohort, we excluded uh, patients with obvious allograft reaction or any prior significant allograft reaction history or any allograft that is close to the scan. Mm -hmm. So what I was thinking is that it's either a chronic myocardial edema, either from uh, low-grade edema or from um, <clears throat> um, basically a congestive heart failure that is subclinical because mm -hmm. it was also kind of associated with um, invasive hemodynamic numbers that suggest um, in increased uh, left ventricular filling pressures. And also mm -hmm. another possibility is a recurrent infections in, in the patient, not necessarily myocarditis, but these patients are immunocompromised because of the medications that they need to take. Um, and we have a one, a kind of cross-sectional look at the patient. So that's also a possibility that I'm thinking. Yeah, no, I, I agree, uh, especially the thought, uh, what also people, everybody knows about pulmonary edema, but what about myocardial edema because of high filling pressures uh, in, in the right atrium, increased pressure in the, in the coronary sinus, and then causing edema with detrimental effects over time. So that is uh, an underappreciated mechanism that hopefully some will do some research on. So thank you so much. There have been a few questions. So <clears throat> Karen had asked, is the edema um, uh, heterogeneous or homogeneous. So my experience clearly is that it's very homogeneous. And now we're talking about uh, COVID. How long does it persist? Uh, cases uh, show that it obviously can persist for longer than uh, two months. So a question to you, uh, Gonkiat, uh, from Riyadh Abuzar. Um, <clears throat> what is the normal T2 uh, in, in your institution? So the, the average T2. Yeah, for, you... for a non we, we don't have a normal, um, we don't have kind of normal for for the transplant patient but for a, some some for clinical use in in northwestern any anything below 60 milliseconds uh, we interpret it as normal but it's not mm -hmm. not exactly at this population because we don't have a normal uh, value in transplant mm -hmm. population yeah and uh, can you please unshare your screen because I wanted to also do, to show uh, one one more. Thing. So sixty is your cutoff. Um, uh, so, but you have said here you had here a fifty uh, as a value. So does it mean that um, that this was still within the normal range? What you saw in these heart transplant patients? Yeah, it could it could be that um, a lower normal value in transplant population is lower mm -hmm. than the, all the other non-transplanted mm -hmm. uh, patients. It could be that okay. possibility. Okay, now that's interesting, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much, especially for the two authors presenting today and, uh, and also to, to Michael uh, joining in. Michael, any, from, any last brief points from your uh, perspective on that work? Well, first of all, thanks for inviting us to present this work. Um, and secondly, I just wanted to echo what you said. I think there is certainly a chronic inflammatory process. I mean, we've had, had other studies where we've compared uh, control populations with transplant populations and specifically those with and without history of rejections. And what we really see throughout the transplant population is that there, is, uh, there are a lot of signs for elevated T2 that's chronically mm -hmm. present in that population, yeah. as, as you suggested. So that's, that's a very interesting, I think, no, no me this, por favor, por favor. A phenomenon that, 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 we, that we see there. And, and I think that's also what, what drives, uh, I mean, what we've seen in this study, that, that's actually related to outcomes. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. So I think that's uh, that's a very important aspect. Okay, so uh, as an announcement, um, next week at this time, there will be an interesting uh, JCMR Journal Club presented by Matthias Stuber on low field versus high field uh, MR. So don't miss that next uh, Wednesday at 11 Eastern. And then uh, we will see each other. Uh, so we'll welcome you back to the CMR Journal Club uh, in August, and we will discuss two papers, uh, both related to myocarditis, uh, sorry, to myocardial perfusion in women.
And uh, there is a very interesting follow-up data from Noel uh, Bayer-Mers um, on uh, results of the YCVD uh, follow-up. And then also from Martin Ugander published recently in Scientific Reports uh, showing these interesting findings that uh, women apparently have a higher myocardial perfusion uh, blood volume and accessory volume when compared to males. So uh, that will be interested and we will also touch upon uh, the, the value of quantitative, uh, absolute quantitative perfusion uh, by CMR in that context. So uh, that, with that said, I want to thank you all very much for joining uh, and especially again the authors for, for uh, presenting and discussion. And uh, wherever you are, I wish you a wonderful evening or uh, a wonderful day or a wonderful morning. Take Thank care you. and everybody and stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.